right folks welcome to sergeant slides youtube channel today we're going to be working on the v8 swap miata drift miata aka poor cobra and uh nothing is broken on it today um we're going to be doing some upgrades so we've been working to get the car ready to go to a track day and as it sits right now it's actually ready to go um so nothing's broken but we got some unexpected upgrades in that's going to make the next track day a lot better and uh so we're going to go ahead and put those on get things moving and that way we're going to have an awesome next track day. So what we have is another TKO 600 transmission. This is the same transmission that I run in the Mustang. And it's actually set up the same way. I have the transmission in the Mustang. This one is already built out with the uh, dog rings. So technically this is now a dog box. And uh, we're going to pull out the old T5. We're going to put this thing in. And um, yeah, then uh, that's probably one of the last upgrades I'm going to do to this car. I have a few other things in mind that I want to do to it, um, but this this is a big one off the list as far as upgrades. wasn't expecting to have quite so soon, um, but it's good to have it, and uh, I got a really great deal on this transmission. So we got to make this swap happen. Now, um, if you follow this build, you'll know that I converted my regular T5 to a hydraulic style slave cylinder. Um, so that's not really gonna be plug and play with this. Um, the reason I did that is because the Miata is um, already set up for hydraulics and even though I prefer the cable, um, it wouldn't be that easy to put a cable set up into this car. It's better just to go with what was already on the chassis. So because they're different transmissions and different bell housings and everything like that, I'm not gonna be able to use the kit that I made for that transmission. I'm going to have to make that kit again for this transmission and it's not the hardest thing in the world so i've got a couple of pieces i went ahead and bought myself a new slave cylinder and i'm taking it apart and everything and uh, basically i'm going to be uh, using these parts to mock up a uh, hydraulic setup on here and then we're just going to take the hydraulics that are on that car and uh, put them onto here so Let's go ahead and go through that process and um, maybe I'll get done before Steve shows up to actually help me with the car. All right guys, so the first thing that needs to happen in order for this to work is we have to figure out a way to get our slave cylinder to sit right around this area here. And uh, I've already started making a bracket. So we've got this guy going on here. It's important to make this strong because uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, torsional forces going on this thing as you press and uh, release the clutch. So I happen to have this thick piece of metal laying around and um, basically it lines up to that. And um, yeah, not a lot to explain here. We're just going to start making the bracket and then we're going to kind of eyeball it into place. Alright guys, so after doing a quick comparison with the old bell housing and this new aftermarket bell housing, um, I've discovered that this building, bell housing here is a good bit wider, so I don't know what that's going to do to me as far as fitment into the car, but I do know that that's going to affect how I mount my adapter bracket here. So whereas on the old transmission, it would have been mounted something like this visually, I'm actually going to have to cut into the bell housing, cut a notch there, because uh, where this pin interfaces with the arm, uh, is going to be in this larger second hole here and if I was to mount this on the outside here um, when I hit the clutch pedal it's not going to give it enough movement to engage and disengage the clutch um, it's just not going to have the right amount of leverage so I've got to get that pin as close to that large hole as possible and we're going to have to take a chunk out of this thing Alright guys, it's nothing like having the confidence to cut up parts that you can't replace. Alright guys, after a lot of difficult eyeballing, this is the bracket that I've come up with. And um, it's on there pretty solid. Of course, I've got it reinforced with my scrap metal, which is just a spare socket that I had laying around. And uh, the other thing that I needed to make was this custom push rod, which I actually made out of a push rod. Um, it's slightly shorter than this one and it interfaces the arm a little bit differently. Um, the biggest difference between this 
setup and the setup in the other car, besides it being recessed into the bell housing, is that I did not bother to make this push rod adjustable. And I just did that in the interest of simplicity. Um, that could be my downfall if this thing doesn't sit in there just right. So I'm really hoping that I got it right, but if it doesn't, um, it's actually really easy to make this, um, but it may not be so easy to uninstall it and reinstall it. So we'll see what happens. Just gonna keep my fingers crossed and uh, just hope that this works out the way that it's planned to, based on my previous experience. All right guys, quick interruption from Future Stu here. The process that I just showed you did work, but it didn't quite work. So uh, a little bit of a spoiler alert, uh, things were a little bit funky and I had to actually get back in here and rip everything out uh, at the end of this video and redesign my uh, hydraulic conversion and uh, get a little bit more leverage on there. So I just wanted to show you what that looks like. And basically, as you can see here, I had to move the slave cylinder inwards on the clutch fork just a little bit more. So what I've got here is another clutch fork that I use, and this is an OEM clutch fork, and I'm glad that I had two of them because um, whatever material this OEM clutch fork is made out of, I could not drill a hole through it with all of my drill bits that I have. I had an aftermarket clutch fork, and I was able to buzz right through that thing, so I went ahead and swapped that inside the car. But originally, I had my push rod lined up to this hole, and this is the hole that I was using on the T5. And on the T5, it worked, but it just barely, barely worked passingly. Um, when I had this here on the TKO, I don't really know what the big difference was, but it worked just well enough for me to get the car moving and change gears, but I was gonna tear something up if I was gonna keep using it in this hole uh, because it just wasn't pushing it far enough. I mean, it could have been three millimeters off that would have gotten me there, but it just wasn't quite getting me there. And as you'll see, the gears and stuff are grinding. So what I went ahead and did is just move this piece all the way over as far as I could, um, which gives me less leverage, but more movement. And I put it about an inch over from the hole that I had it in before, which is here. And um, so as of now, it's not tested, but everything's back inside the car and I do have a much better feeling about it. We'll see how that goes and you'll probably find out in the next video sometime because right now the car is not back together yet. Also, I want to go ahead and just show you some snapshots that I took of the process of me revising this thing and what it looks like. And again, I just wanted to show that to you because I know that I get a lot of my ideas from videos and stuff that I see from other people. And if somebody in the future happens to be doing something similar, I don't want to lead anybody down the wrong path to failure. And I just want to make sure that if you ever do this in the future, make sure that you get as much throw as you can. Um, using one of these outside holes is, is not really gonna get you enough movement. Since I have this little access port here down in my footwell, I guess I will go ahead and show you guys the mechanism in action. And uh, what you're seeing right there is the end of the clutch fork and a little bit of the slave cylinder. And I'm gonna go ahead and press the pedal. And you don't really see much movement there, but whereas before I was getting about an inch, now I think I'm getting about an inch and a half. So I should be pretty comfortable with that amount of movement right there. All right, guys, I got the transmission pulled out. Been doing more work than video, but that's fine. Again, not doing anything groundbreaking here and nothing that I really need to demonstrate or show to you guys. It's just pulling a transmission out. So uh, in front, we've got our old T5 that's coming out. Over here is the TKO 600. So for folks that don't know what these are, um, T5s are notoriously fragile. And uh, whether or not they're as bad as people really say they are is a little bit of a subject of debate. But either way, they're notorious for being fragile. So Tremec, uh invented this transmission here to be a plug and play replacement for a T5 and it's way stronger. This being the 600 variant, it's supposed to be good for 600 foot pounds of torque. I don't remember what the official rating for the T5 is, but like I said, they're just known for being weak. I don't necessarily agree with that. That's just what they're known for. And they do break a lot, so I don't know, it's up to you. Either way, um, a little tidbit of information. There is a very, very similar transmission to this uh, made by Tremec called, I believe it's called the Tremec uh, 3550. 
and uh, it comes in a 2004 Mustang manual from factory. It's, it's very, very similar to this. In fact, some of the parts may even be interchangeable. So if you happen to know of an 04 Mustang that's getting parted out, and uh, you might want to get that transmission out of there because a lot of people don't realize what's in there. So anyways, this one here that we're putting in the car has been further modified. Uh, first through fourth gears have dog rings in them, which means that that thing's going to go into gear um, with or without the clutch. It's going to shift. And that's an issue that I've been having with this car is that up in the banks going from second to third is kind of a long shift and it's just not easy for me to drive the car the way that I need to be able to do it. So with this giving me the ability to actually shift faster, I can drive this car hard the way that it needs to be driven. So I would say that I'm about halfway done at this point, but from here on out, it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, this bell housing is a lot larger than what's in the car and it's already a tight fit. So after I pull the bell housing out, I'll do a little side-by-side -side comparison just to show what we're looking at. Position, these are the two clutch forks and throwout bearings, which these things are exactly the same. Just looks like this is probably a newer aftermarket piece. Same thing. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna continue working. We're gonna get the bell housing out of there and the clutch out of there. And then we're gonna work in reverse. We're gonna put the new clutch in. Got my handy clutch alignment tool and um, then once this is all over with, we're going to beef up the uh, fender flares so that I don't keep blowing those things off of the car. Uh, Let me two see. degrees and you're out. There it goes. It's two degrees. Oh yeah, this is a tight fit, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alright guys, another jump forward. This enormous bell housing. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and put these things side by side. All right, guys. So another slight hold up. Um, as you can see, this is what came out of the car, and this is what's going into the car. Huge difference between these guys. Obviously, the bolt pattern behind the engine is going to be pretty much the same, uh, but the dimensions of these bell housings is completely different. As you can see, this one is very cylindrical on the right, and this one over here is very conical, which uh, you're a lot more economical on space on this side. You can fit this thing into a lot more places. And this one here, I don't know what they were thinking when they designed it. Uh, I don't know, this thing's probably made to go into like a Chevelle or like an Impala or something. Um, anyways, this one here was already a tight fit and difficult to go in there. It was barely in there. And this thing here, um, yeah, I've had to massage the inside of the trans tunnel and everything. And uh, we're just not getting it in there. So I've marked out an area where it was making contact. And um, we're going to have to do a little bit of cutting and modding, a little bit more cutting and modding to this bell housing. All right, so if I wasn't clear, the plan is now that I've got that cut out, is to basically try to push that in and um, then we're going to mock it up and then if it clears then we're going to go back and we're going to fill this back in with weld. Alright guys so I ended up cutting a little bit more than what I had planned so I ended up making a second cut here because this actually missed the mark but that's fine because this gives me a better shape here so I don't know you can't really see on camera the indentation that that makes but uh, maybe you'll be able to see it a little bit better once it's painted. So I'm just gonna fill all of this in, weld these seams back together to give it strength. Um, this over here on the starter bubble was also causing me some interference and I just basically cut that section out. Um, I'll probably just leave that one as is. It's probably not good that I do that, but it's probably not that bad either. Um, either way, I'm not gonna worry about it. And um, once it's back in the car, I could probably find something to just kind of patch that hole with. So let's go ahead and get welding. All right, here we are all welded up. And uh, I don't know, that kind of gives you an idea of the depth that we got out of that, it's about a half an inch. Pretty happy with that. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and slap some paint on that thing, let it dry up a little bit, and uh, then we're gonna try and put it in the car and go for the transmission next. All right, guys. Here's a quick update. 
we had the bell housing in the car and uh, we actually even had the transmission in the car so I know all of that stuff fits uh, but it's back outside the car because I did something kind of dumb uh, installing a manual transmission is always kind of difficult uh, especially for me because uh, getting it to slide in there I use the clutch alignment tool and everything and uh, just getting it to go that last half an inch where the input shaft lines up with the pilot bearing has just always been a difficult thing for me so what I did was a big no-no um, in which I mounted the transmission I had it there to that last half inch and I tried to basically draw it in with the bolts it's worked for me in the past even though you're not supposed to do that um, and in this case I ended up stripping the threads off of the bolts into the transmission so um, I don't have a thread tap for this and the only way for me to fix it is to either take it to a shop that has a thread tap or for me to do a quick repair to it um, involving welding so versus taking another couple of days I'm just gonna go ahead and weld this thing and repair it myself and uh, hopefully I'll figure out a better way of getting that transmission mounted in there but it's a big sigh of relief while everything was in the car I got a chance to test out my slave cylinder that's all lined up perfect which I had a lot of anxiety about like I said the bell housing fits I've got plenty of space for the transmission even though I'm gonna have to make a little bit of clearance uh, just for the shifter uh, that's not a big deal it fits in the trans tunnel and that's the, that's the biggest thing that I was worried about during this process because it's such a tight fit so we're gonna keep pushing forwards and um, I guess I'll show you guys I plan on repairing this thing so since these threads are all jacked up in here I'm basically just going to drill this hole out and I have some grade 8 hardware which I just picked up which is the same thread size and everything and I'm just going to take this guy and weld that in there like such and there's tons of clearance so I'm not worried about anything interfering with anything and that's going to be that and uh, then we're going to put it back in the car and not make dumb mistakes again. All right, guys, I got the transmission in there. Uh, I used a little bit of a dirty trick, but it worked out beautifully. So I didn't put it on tape because it's one of those things where if it didn't work, I wasn't gonna show you guys about it. Um, but anyways, let me explain what I did. So just for context, let's say this is your transmission here. That's your output shaft. And this is my TKO and there's my shifter, right? Yeah, so anyways, you've got an input shaft which is this guy and I drew all of that for no reason because I'm still gonna have to blow up my drawing but anyways the end of the input shaft looks kind of like that it's beveled and um, I think what happens is when you go to put that thing in there either this edge here or somewhere along here or somewhere along here it makes contact with the pilot bearing and it's just not able to slide past that point so basically what I did is I just went in with my angle grinder and I just kind of smoothed that over made it nice and smooth on both sides and uh, now it can just slide right there into the pilot bearing super easy and uh, and it did it worked so I just wanted to show you that before I show you the actual footage of me putting a transmission in here it is now wait, wait. Alright guys, so here we are underneath the car, and you can see that the transmission is in there. So anyways, um, as you can see here, we've got no space to spare. So glad this thing fit in here. Um, I enlarged the shifter hole just a little bit, so I'm going to go and throw that in the car uh, just before I wrap up for the day and see what that looks like in there. I'm going to have to redesign my cross member for transmission just a little bit. As you can see, the bushings for the mounts for the cross member are there, and the um, actual transmission mount is back about three inches. So no big deal there. Uh, that'll probably take me, you know, a total of under an hour to do. 
I haven't fitted the starter yet. I'm a little bit worried about that just because anything could happen. And, uh, you know, you don't really know what you have until you know. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and then also there is the exhaust. If the dimensions of this are any different than the T5, then I'm going to have issues with the exhaust fitment and I'm going to have to cut and re-weld that. That's a pain in the butt, but I know that I can do that, so I'm not really stressed about it. Um, it's just that it's just going to take time. Uh, besides that, everything else here on the car is just going to go back together uh, the same way that it came apart. So I think I'll say that I'm, I'm at, definitely at the top of the hill. I'm not headed downhill just yet, but um, I'm cresting that halfway point as of now. And uh, things... The, uh, the major anomalies have been accounted for and I'm super happy about that. Alright guys, we got the car mostly back together. Um, it is in drivable condition right now, but I just don't have the exhaust on. And uh, there it is back, back there behind the car. I just don't feel like fighting with that tonight. So I'm going to leave that for another day. Um, so what I'm going to start to tackle right now is going to be my reinforced fender flares. So once again, we've got my uh, beefed up fender flares from JDM fender flares. And then we've also got a set of metal fender flares. I got four flares. I'm going to combine two of these on each side just to make it extra thick because I keep blowing my fender flares off every track day when I blow tires and get too carried away. Alright guys, just as I breathe the sigh of relief, my custom built Y pipe does not fit because of this massive bell housing that I have in here. It's blocking things. So I think I've probably spent more hours on this piece right here than any other part of anything on the car. And now I have to cut it up and uh, get it fitted in again. So um, this here is the passenger side and um, I want to keep everything the way that it is and um, the driver's side is where we've got interference so I think I'm just going to cut this thing off right here and try to bolt this into the car because I still have some places where this thing lines up and then try to reroute this thing uh, the way that it needs to go. We'll see. Alright guys, so since I don't have fancy tube bending and cutting tools, um, the technique that I've come up with to get my exhaust pipes in just the right shape, especially when I have tight spaces, is that um, basically whatever shape I'm dealing with, I'll go ahead and I'll make relief cuts in it. Um, it takes a lot of eyeballing and mocking up, but I'll make relief cuts in it to bend it in the uh, direction that I need it to go in. So in this scenario, the pipe sits in the car like that. and. Um, I needed this section of the pipe to bend up a little bit, so I made a relief cut here, tilted it just slightly that way just to give myself about a half an inch, and then this uh, side needed to curl a little bit more tightly around the bell housing to get around the back of the bell housing, and uh, with this shape that I've come up with here, I've got it actually within about two inches of lining up to the other pipe, so it's at a really weird angle, and that's going to be challenging for me to fill that gap in between. Um, especially laying on my back because I just don't want to weld laying on my back because that's how you get hot metal on you and that's really unpleasant. Um, so we'll see what I do about joining the two pipes but for right now that I've got my bends in, what I'm going to do to lock these bends in is I'm just going to weld these little edges right here. That's going to make this thing so that it won't flex anymore and then I'm just going to make some really ugly pie cuts out of uh, this section of extra pipe. This is all of the extra pipe that I have left. Um, and I'm going to use about half of that to finish this exhaust here. So it's probably going to take me a little while, but I'm going to get it done.
drive. Well, the swap is done, but we've got some issues. Um, there's a really loud noise. I think that it sounds like there's an exhaust leak going on over here, like a massive exhaust leak. Um, so I'm going to have to take a look at that. Obviously, I took the header off and uh, had to put it back on. I may have messed up the gasket, so I'm not 100% sure what's going on with that noise. Um, the other thing is, um, as you could see, it was really hard for me to get it into like first gear or reverse. And I think that's due to the clutch not fully disengaging. And that was an issue that I was having on the last transmission. But it worked just well enough to function. Um, in this case, I would say that it's not passing. And if I was to leave it like this, I would definitely tear something up. Uh, but as far as this video goes, um, we're just going to go ahead and call this one complete. Maybe not 100% successful, but that's how it goes in this race car life. And we'll catch you on the next one.